Welcome everyone and I'm very pleased to be uh, starting off the day with a really interesting session into what kind of modern scientific methods can contribute to our understanding of movement um, and connectivity of people in the past. And we're going to be looking at the methods of DNA analysis and stable isotopes, I believe. So I, without much further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker to the podium. Um, so this is Dr. Uh, Jacqueline Cahill wilson of the Royal Agriculture uh, uh, University in Cirencester. And uh, Jacqueline has uh, worked um, on especially the Irish Iron Age and early medieval period over uh, the last years. And she has brought together archaeological perspectives with those derived from the analysis in her own work on uh, stable isotopes to look at the question of what can the uh, bodies, the remains of the people that we study, tell us about their movement and connectivity in the past. So uh, thank you very much, Jacqueline, for being with us. And yeah, so So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jacqueline Cahill, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about how we look for individuals who we believe may have migrated within uh, the archaeological research. So in terms of mobility and migration, these are absolutely essential to all the research that I've done over many years. And that's because I am an economic migrant. After my leaving cert, I left to join my sisters in England, like so many of us, I'm sure, in the room. But I'm also the child of economic migrants because my father, a cattle from Longford, and my mother, a Quinn from Mayo, left in the 1950s and settled uh, in Manchester and had their children uh, in, in Manchester. We subsequently came back to Ireland. So in many respects, in my abstract, I said that um, much of the research and the sciences that I'm going to talk about today could not have been achieved, could not have been done without the work of many scholars throughout many years, not least Dr. Becker and her work on finding the invisible people. And this is because the research that we do and the sciences that we use have really only been developed in the last 20 plus years. And I'll start at the very outset by saying that isotopes are very good at demonstrating where someone is not from. Um, it's, it's one of those things that people expect that we're able to say where somebody actually originated. But as far as the work is concerned, origin and identities are two completely different things. Our origin is fixed, um, as we'll see, and it's fixed as chemical traces in our bodies. Um, but our identities are fluid, they are malleable, and they change over many times, and depending on where we are. The social circumstances of our identities is very important in terms of archaeology. But you can be lucky. It is much more difficult to suggest where somebody is from, but you, as I say, you can be lucky. And if the geology is very different, if it's markedly younger or older, if the geography is very different, that too will tell us if it's very arid or if there's a lot of rainfall. And then the material culture itself from the sites that we're looking at will be indicative as to whether there's something unusual or different that's drawn us as archaeologists to have a look at a particular site or have a look at a particular burial. So our work as archaeologists, as I'm sure the archaeologists in the room will appreciate this, is about peopling the past. So we look for particular sites and we try to identify the type of exploratory frameworks within which we're going to assess them. What are the frameworks that we can use? Are we looking at it at a local level? Are we looking at it at a more broader level? Especially when we're talking about things like migration and migrancy. And only then do we have a look and apply a whole suite of scientific analysis to the material itself. Now, I'm talking about isotope ratio analysis, but there's a whole host of different suites of analysis. Ed's going to talk about DNA. Um, and in, in many respects, it's a sister system that we can use to really understand where people have originated and why they've come to be buried in the place where they, we have found them. And only then do we bring everything together, including the material culture, the things that have led us to the particular site, to have a look and see where these people might actually be from. 
So any archaeologists in the room will probably groan now because I'm going to drop in quite a few adages that we use in archaeology. And the first one that we use with isotope ratio is you are what you eat. So everything that you eat and drink and absorb leaves a chemical signature, a chemical trace in your body. And even from before you were born. Um, so what we are doing is we are looking to identify these. So... Um, Essentially, we're, we're looking to analyse the measurement of the isotope ratios in your actual teeth and bone. And we use a certain set of isotopes, um, and it's the ratio of these, the measurement of the weight, the relative weight of these, that we're identifying in the analysis. So we use um, things like strontium, which is everything um, in the rock underneath your feet. So where you have lived will dictate the strontium ratios that's left in, in your skeleton and in your teeth. Um, and we have certain ratios that we measure um, for strontium. And then we use carbon and nitrogen, which can tell us about food pathways and diet. I'm not going to talk, it can also tell us about mobility, but I'm not going to talk about those too much today because we're going to focus on the migrators, uh, the mobility. We also use lead because lead is interesting because there is a baseline level of lead in the atmosphere, in the environmental area where you live. Um, but at certain points pre-industrialization, there are certain periods when lead production will have left an environmental, a much higher env environmental record, certainly in the Roman period where we have a lot of industrial uh, lead production. And we also use oxygen. And oxygen, and in particular what we call the heavy isogen oxytope, delta 18. And this is dictated by precipitation, so rainfall. So these are the sort of suite of isotopes. There are more. Um, the systems and the methods that we use, the methodology that we use is being refined all the time and now includes things like sulfur, which can give us maritime influence, and, and others as we develop it. So identifying migrants themselves, as I say, you need to start first with the particular aspects of the burials or the material culture. There's some reason why we're looking at individuals, why we think they might be migrants. Um, and in many respects, this can be in, in the prehistory and early medieval period, we tend to have a series of burial types that we regard as normative. So in Ireland, there's a certain type of burial that we would expect to find when we're doing an archaeological excavation. If a burial varies from that, if it differs from that, then it is suggestive that it is an unusual or maybe an intrusive um, burial type in that particular time frame that we're looking at. Um, and that's what will lead us to then investigate it further in relation to these isotopes to have a better look. So we use teeth dental enamel, and we use bone, and bone collagen. And teeth, the enamel in our teeth, is the hardest material in our bodies. It's made up of hydroxyapatite, and we actually use diamond cutters to actually sample the, the teeth themselves. And the reason why we use enamel is it's fixed. What you've eaten and drank up until the point at which the tooth mineralizes is locked in like a little time capsule, if you like, and it doesn't vary very much subsequently. Um, so what it will give us is an isotopic signature of where someone was raised, so the geology and the, and the oxygen of the particular area where someone was raised. So bone remodels in our body. So the skeleton that we're left with when we're put into the ground, they are not the same bones that we had when we were young. So it remodels on average about 10 years. Depending on the bone in particular, the smaller, thinner bones will remodel more quickly than the harder, bigger bones. And because it remodels, it tells us of the last years in life. So you have enamel, which will tell you of the earliest years in life, and then the bone, which will give you an indicator of the last years of life. And you can see how, if you do a comparative analysis, that if they differ greatly, significantly, then perhaps the individual was not raised in the same area in which they were buried. And this is one of the reasons why it allows us to reconstruct mobility. 
So we have data sets. I'm sure Ed's going to talk about data sets as well, but they're incredibly important. And I mentioned the scholars that have come before and the work that they have done collecting the information and the data, which allows us to then apply, as new sciences are developed, allows us to apply to these collections, these data sets. And for us, for the work that we're doing, it's incredibly important that we all share that data and then we can build out and refine the methods and refine the information that we have. So we use um, a geological uh, data set um, which is, has been produced for the two islands and it's pretty significant now at this stage. So that will give us the baseline signature of the rock type that we're looking at. So this is for the strontium. The reason for doing this is that even in an area where you've got a great swathe of carboniferous limestone that runs right across Ireland and Britain and into Scotland, within those larger belts you often get markedly younger rock or markedly older rock and the more data that we collect the more refined we can make it so even if it's in an area where we think we know what the data level should be sometimes it throws us a googly and something unusual can be found and then we've also now got a secondary set of data thanks to the work that's been done primarily at TCD um, we have what we call biosphere data so it's a case of belt and braces really in terms of these data sets so we have one set that will give us the geology, the, what we need from the geological conditions, and then we have the biosphere. And biosphere is basically a collection of data based on the vegetation. So it refines it even further, so the vegetation that's growing. So if there's any variance, we have that as a secondary set. And then on top of that, we have what we call the heavy isogen, uh, oxygen isotope, delta-18, which will give us an indication of uh, where someone lived in terms of rainfall, in terms of uh, geography, topography, um, and it allows us to, again, map all of these relative to the actual data that we're getting from the individual themselves. So we use a system called mass spectrometry. Now, there's lots of different types of mass spectrometry. When we did the majority of our work, we used something called TIMS, which is thermal ionization, which is uh, basically vaporizing the samples. And the, the instrumentation that we have here in Ireland is, um, you know, it's world class. So at TCD and at UCD and at Queen's University Belfast, all of the instrumentation that we need to do this sort of scientific analysis is already in situ, so to speak. But like everything else, there is a cost associated with doing these additional um, scientific analysis that would be done. Um, and we also use something called LAMC, ICPMS, which is laser ablation. Um, and I don't expect anyone to remember. There's too many words, isn't there, in that? Um, but the, um, basically, this means that if we've got very precious samples, if we've got individual samples that we don't want to cut into, we can do this on the surface of them and get very, very, very precise measurements uh, in terms of how we actually read the ratios that we're looking for. Um, and a very good example of that is the work that was done by Professors Horton and Pike at the University of Bristol. Um, they were asked to identify a skeleton that was found in Magdeburg. And the historical uh, suggestion was that she was Princess Edith. So that would make her the granddaughter of King Alfred the Great. So needless to say, a very important individual to be able to identify. And we know from historical records and the... Um, the ascriptions that are given often to various pieces or relics of individuals in various cathedrals and churches, you know, often you have 22 finger bones of a certain individual, so it's very important that we had a, a look at it. So what Mark and Alistair did was they did this laser ablation mass spectrometry and pretty much read month by month where this individual had been and spent her time. I said that you can be lucky in terms of the geology and uh, you know, that it's markedly different. And in fact, this is a good example of that because the historical records say that she spent a lot of time in Wessex and in particular in the area around Winchester. 
and Winchester is on the chalk, which is a markedly different isotope ratio. So it was, in many respects, a sort of a QED in, in terms of the sampling. They could confirm that the isotope ratios should, suggested that she did move around the landscape as the historical records had suggested. So in terms of animals, is it, they are exactly the same principles that we use to track animals. And this is Brendan, the, wolf, the wolfhound. And um, anybody who's heard me talk before, I love this picture because it gives you an indication of the sheer size that we are talking about, because his owner is actually six foot tall. Um, so you can see when we have a classical record referring by, by Symmachus of the 4th century, they talk about seven Irish dogs being paraded through the streets of Rome and they thought they, that for people's amusement, and they thought they should have been kept in cages, a bit like the other exotic animals that were being paraded by, through the streets of Rome. And we suspect what we're actually seeing here is the exportation of hunting dogs and something like a wolfhound, if it was that size. Of course, it's probably a bit of exaggeration as well. So that method that I mentioned, LAICPMS, this is what we use to investigate a burial for Dr. Elizabeth O'Brien. A lot of you will know Dr. O'Brien. She's a leading burial and funerary archaeologist in Ireland. And this was a site called FARTA, which we did in association with her as part of the Discovery Programme project that I'll talk about in a minute. And you can very clearly see that the horse has gone on holiday to a different geology, but when you look at this, and of course the horse is not going to go on holiday by itself. What we actually demonstrated was very, very detailed, very precise measurements. And when we looked at the lady as well, it's very clear that it does not match the geology of County Galway, where this uh, very important female and horse burial was found. So you can, again, it, you can see the precision that comes out when we use this type of technique. And we, um, we had a recent paper that was published by uh, Dr. Rich Madwick at Cardiff and his colleagues. I think Finbar McCormick was involved in it as well. And they investigated a lot of the animal remains from the 40-metre structure at Navan Fort, which we all know is probably one of the most important sites in Ireland in terms of ceremony. And what he did, the, the isotopes that you can see down the bottom, you can see what I mean about the collection of data and why it's so important that we share this data, publish it, so that we can build on the data that other people have put together. And what Rich has used is a lot of my own um, isotope results, plus the uh, research that we published for the Discovery Program. But what Rich found when he did this investigation is that the animals, um, oh, and he used sulfur, by the way, which is another method which I'm not going to talk about, but it's very good at indicating if there's a coastal or a maritime influence um, in the isotopic ratios. What they demonstrated by this wonderful piece of research is that the animals that were being, uh, the remains that they found around the 40-metre structure at Navan were not just from Ulster. They came from all over Ireland, some of them over great distances. And just like a horse doesn't go on holiday by itself, the animals didn't take themselves to Navan. So we have this mass influx of people from all over Ireland coming together at Navan Fort. Um, and this is, you know, indicated. So we may not have the skeletal remains that would match the sheer scale of the animal remains, but certainly we can say that it is indicative of lots of people coming together at Navan Fort. So another site I just wanted to talk about briefly, because this brings me up to the period in question, which is the late Iron Age and the early medieval period, is the burial that was the burials that were found at Lambe Island, and I want to talk about them. We didn't actually sample the skeletons from Lambe, but I want to talk about it in terms of why this science is offering a different way to see the past, because the material from Lambe Island was found when they were building um, a new harbour in the 20th century. So they found some skeletons, and they found essentially some late uh, pre-Roman Iron Age stroke Roman material there. Now, because of the nature of the material, um, it was suggested that these were refugees and that the dates, the Roman brooches dated quite closely to a period between AD 50 and AD 75. We have a very close typology for Roman brooches that we can use to date things. So because of the nature of the date and the dating, it was suggested that perhaps these were people fleeing ahead 
of the Roman conquest in Roman Britain. And this is entirely possible. Um, but it, the, the, the material in question that sort of led them to this conclusion is this beaded talk that you can see in the center photograph. Now, these talks um, appear geographically in this period just before the Roman conquest in northern Britain in the territory of a group known as the Brigantes. Um, and the Brigantes were constantly, uh, they did not give the Romans an easy job in terms of conquering the country. So it is entirely possible. However, we have to be really careful about giving an origin, giving an identity to people based on one aspect of the material culture alone. And when we do perhaps get to sample these skeletons, it would be very interesting to see. It is entirely likely that this was a settlement, um, given the nature of the material that was here. Um, and it could be that what we have on Lambe is, if you like, a, a site that's bordering another very important site in Dublin Bay. And that site in question is the quite controversial site of Germana Promontory in North County Dublin. Now, Germana has been steeped in politics and controversy because over a period of about 40 years, it was systematically looted by metal de detectors, illegally looted and material robbed off the site. Thankfully, because of conversations that took place around the Discovery Programme's Lyrae project, it is now under the care and conservation of Bingor County Council, I'm delighted to say, and it is protected for the state. But the reason why I think this is important is I believe this to be an emporium, a trading site. And no, I do not believe that it's the site of a Roman invasion, so let's get that one out of the way completely. It's much more likely that what we have here is a melding, a blending of um, two, if you like, material cultures. Because the material from the site is not just Roman. It is in parts of Roman type, but there is also a lot of material from the site. You'll see that horse bit type. This is not the material from Germana, by the way. This, these are just similar examples for you. The type of Irish type horse bit which is regarded as quintessentially Irish, they were manufacturing these on the site. And we also have these Y-shaped pendants, which have quite uh, recently been reviewed by Rena Maguire, and she convincingly demonstrates that they are a type of horse bosal. But also we have these trumpet, the moles to make trumpet brooches. Now, as far as I'm aware, there are no trumpet, Roman trumpet brooches in Ireland. Uh, we haven't found any. So there is this question of whether or not they were being made on the site and exported back to Rome in Britain. Now, this strange ingot that you can see is a Romano-British type copper ingot. There were over 40 of these looted from the site. Um, they are in the care of the National Museum of Ireland now, but some of them are stamped in a Roman style and they are a particular Romano-British style. Some of them were quartered, some of them were halved which leads us to conclude that they were actually manufacturing material from this, this copper. And the reason why we think that is because next door to the site of Dramana is an old copper mine which was exploited in the 17th and 18th century, and a little bit further. So these bun ingots, these bun ingot types, one of the things I didn't say is that one of the things we can do is provenance metals through isotope analysis, and in particular through lead. So we didn't get a chance to do the bun ingots themselves. But what we did do was go to the mine and take a sample of the copper there. And we now have a discrete lead isotope ratio. So what we can do, if we want to do further work, is trace this Irish copper from Dramana through the period and through if it is being exported into the Roman world. We will be able to trace it across by sampling the material that's made from it. And people often say to me, why on earth would the Romans, you know, what would we have been trading um, with the Romans? And, you know, why isn't there more evidence? And I think there's a remarkable correlation between precious metals and minerals in Ireland and the clusters of Roman material that we find in Ireland. <coughs> Excuse me. And these are mostly domestic type clusters of material, I should add. Um, and so that's, that's one of the reasons I think, but we also would have been exporting cattle, we would, probably would have been exporting grain and other goods through to the Roman world. So directly across the Irish Sea from, from the sites that we've just been talking about, a scholar called Dr. Katie Hema has done some work on a series of burial sites along 
the coast of Wales. Now, we know that there's a relationship in the later period because of the occurrence of this type of pottery, which is late Roman pottery. This is, is, is what we call African red slipware. And this comes in at a later period, and it's dotted all around the south of Wales, down into the Severn Valley region, and all along the eastern seaboard of Ireland. And in fact, there's a lot at a site in County Cork called Gorans. What Katie found with her analysis, all of her isotope analysis, is that not only did she find uh, people who she thinks are from the Mediterranean world, but she also found people who she believes may be from the west coast of Ireland, um, which would give weight to the idea of this ebb and flow of migration to and from across the Irish Sea. The other point that she made, which is very, very important, is that we tend to think of traders as opposed to raiders, or settlers, as very transient. So people are coming, they're dropping off their wares, they're selling them, they're taking the till back. So we think of it as quite transient not, and stop-off point, so to speak. But what Katie found in her analysis was a lot of women, a lot of children, and a lot of infants, relatively speaking to the size of the analysis that she did, which suggests that for some people, they were migrants. They were not necessarily returning to where they had originated. So this coastline that we talk about along the eastern seaboard, one of the sites that I was lucky enough to do an analysis on was at Bettystown. I'll call it Bettystown 1 because there is another Bettystown. Um, and this was for the former Keeper of Irish Antiquities, Eamon P. Kelly, who very kindly let me look at his notes and his excavation from Bettystown. And when I was doing this as part of my research, it was very early days as far as isotopes were concerned. But what I did find was a mix of burials of people who we might think to be buried in a local tradition. We found some people who we think were foreigners or migrants. Um, and when we sampled them, what was even more interesting is that the local type burials, some of them, the people who we sampled, were not local. So they were migrants, but they were buried in what we would expect to be an Irish-type burial form or funerary form. And the flip side is true as well. Some of the burials that we sampled that we thought were foreigners turned out to be local people or to have isotope ratios to be local. So this concept of identity and how we represent ourselves, and for the archaeologists, here comes another one, the dead don't bury themselves. So... It is that thing that it's much more complex in terms of our material culture and our cultural associations and our social signifiers in terms of how we represent ourselves or people represent us in death. And there is, the site of Bettistown is particularly important because one of the burials that I, I sampled because I thought he was a local individual buried in a, a typical type of burial of the period turned out to have an oxygen isotope signature which would suggest he had come straight from the northern African coast. And that African red slipware bowl that I mentioned, um, he seems to have been you know, in that area where you've got this importation. So these would have been the provinces, the Roman provinces in North Africa. African red slipware comes from Tunisia and we have an even more exotic type called Phokian red slip which comes all the way from Turkey. And we also have amphorae types, LR1 or B2 as they're known, all clustered along these sites along the eastern seaboard, all of which have been found in Ireland and across the Irish Sea. So it links it all together. So we know for this period in time, this is the Barbarica Conspiratio, as it's known from the classical histories, a point at which we're told some sort of pact breaks down between the Romans who are in Roman Britain and the rest of Ireland and Scotland and Wales. We know that people were on the move. We know that people were moving. We know the Goths and the Huns were coming into Europe. We know that the Votadini in Scotland were moving down into what was Roman Britain. And the reason for this is really quite simple. That control, that hold that Roman power had on keeping people out or keeping people in had waned. Most of the garrisons, despite what you hear, we had already left by 300s in, in Roman Britain. The vast majority of the troops had been moved to Europe. And so there was a minimal garrison on a lot of these sites. And the local neighbours would have known this. We also have this area of the Severn Valley, which is rich with um, you know, the villa estate economy. And this is where we think the trading between uh, the raiding 
between Ireland and Britain takes over from the trading between Ireland and Britain. And of course we have the most famous Romana British captive of all, uh, St. Patrick. And one of the things that I think is really important is whether or not you agree with the latest um, analysis on whether Patrick was actually a slave or took himself off to Ireland, basically, you know, the more recent scholarship. What is essential from the writings that we have is that he regarded himself as an alien amongst people. He had been part of a However he got to Ireland, raiding was endemic as far as the history of this period was concerned. This was part of the cultures between these neighbouring islands. And he writes this letter to Caroticus, an excoriating letter, uh, because these people that he had baptised had been, been um, attacked. Some of them had been killed. Some of them had been stolen away as slaves. But I do find it very interesting that he asks first for the booty to be uh, returned, and only later the people themselves. So maybe there's a bit of conflict going on with Patrick. Thanks, Katarina. So I mentioned briefly the Discovery Programs project that we did, and in fact, I'm told by Una and the World Wordwell staff that there is a copy of the book in the lobby, should anybody wish to buy it. And I think we quite categorically demonstrated the movement of people and animals and things into Ireland during this period. So following on from the discovery programme, Colleen O'Driscoll and I returned to Freestone Hill, um, a site that was excavated by, excavated by Gerhard Bursu, who was himself a migrant or a refugee. Um, and we decided to look again at some of the material. Now we did swathes of geophysics, uh, and what we have clearly identified is there is much more to do, including, I hope, provenancing of metals that may come out of the site. But we wanted to do that because there is another site nearby, which we also did where a lot of geophysics on, and we think we have located the burial site of the Roman uh, Isingsform cremation that was found. And again, the dead do not bury themselves, and this was found uh, in the correct Roman form um, in Stonyford in County Kilkenny. So we also think we've discovered another potential barrow site, and we also think um, we have this very unusual banjo-type enclosure, which is regarded as earlier Iron Age and quintessentially an English type of monument. So much more to do on these sites. And yes, and we'll be following up in terms of a lot of the material that's been found in Ireland, and now we're going to look for Irish migrants in Roman Britain, because we think we've got convincing evidence and with the help of the sciences, we can now look to see and assess and reassess skeletal evidence from, late, uh, from Roman Britain and late Roman Britain. And I'm just going to show you briefly one of the sites that we hope to look at. This is a site called Nettleton Scrub, which is a Roman temple, which in the 4th century, something catastrophic happened. The excavator found burials, literally skeletons, where they fell. These weren't buried. These were people who fell and you can see that a lot of them were face down. But on analysis, you can see that they have cut marks and sword marks on the actual bones themselves. Now, the excavator, the archaeologist, thought that this might be a site of Roman settlers, or it might be a site that was raided by um, Irish um, people. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look and get a date, dating and some isotopes from them. So there is a big question that remains over the dating of literacy in Ireland, and uh, this came out from the project that we did. So there's much more to do in terms of looking at the dating, because the Roman material does give us a much earlier. The more we look, the further back we seem to be able to, to push the origin of literacy in Ireland. The uh, top uh, left-hand corner, you can see a tiny little seal box, and this was found on Dramana. And this would have sealed correspondence, like, you know, the wooden tablets that we get from Vindolanda on Hadrian's Wall. We also have the origin of the Oum itself, which again, we seem to be able to push back and back and back. And you see on this little copper alloy plate, there is an Oum inscription scratched onto it. So this is one of the few uh, non-monumental uh, Oums that we have. So we're doing a load of work on it. And this is from Newgrange. and doing a lot of work on it at the moment, so watch the space, and we'll let you know what we find. So just to sort of bring everything to a conclusion, Roman migrants and traders 
were here in Ireland, but we also have settlement. We also think we have settlement, and some of the work that we'll be carrying on at Freestone and Kilkenny, the southeast region seems to be fallen. And of course, this is the area, the southeast and the south, where we have most of the Ohm inscriptions. And of course, we have that fabulous site of Garans as well. Um, so one of the things, we were talking about how you try to identify whether or not somebody is first generation or second generation migrant. And I just leave this to you to have a little ponder about. But clustered around the River Barrow and the River Blackwater, we've got six Oum inscriptions, and three of them have Roman names on them. Sagittari, Mariani, and Amatus. And some people have said to me, well, they're also Gaulish names, which they are, in fairness. But, you know, whether Gaul or Roman Britain, they are people who are identifying and using Roman names. But we also have something that's even more curious, and that is we have three more that have Roman-named fathers with Irish-named sons. So here we have that question of identity. Are they still regarding themselves as Roman, or are they, in fact, becoming Irish? And I leave that thought with you. So just to conclude, the sciences are challenging a lot of what we know. They're really challenging us to look again at the narratives of the past and see how we view mobility and see how we view identity and what we think of as migrants. And we still have an awful lot to learn. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.